me lucky, call me blessed. I've ears to hear and eyes to see. precious family a place to lay my head and rest don't call me lucky call me blessed don't call me lucky call me blessed this life of mine's no chance success I know Jesus is my happiness don't call me lucky, call me blessed. Blessed are the meek and lowly while on this earth they tried. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for I know that they'll see God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't call them lucky, call me blessed. Don't call me lucky, call me blessed. This life of mine's no chance success. I know Jesus is my happiness. Don't call me lucky, call me blessed. Don't call me lucky, call me blessed. We continue, or rather we conclude, uh, we'll look at the church at Ephesus from the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As we look at and consider carefully and prayerfully what the Spirit would say to our hearts and lives today. First aid for the first love. Beginning with Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and I will read all seven verses. Unto the angel of the church... Of Ephesus right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, or lampstands. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst bear them which are evil, that thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted or become weary. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That was a group of heretical, cult-like people who were bringing people astray from uh, a classic Christian faith. Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Jesus commanded the Ephesian church to return to its first love, and Jesus commands the church today to return to its first love. Always a wise course of action. Matthew Poole said a long time ago, Recover your former warmth of love and zeal for good works. And if ever there were a time to begin that afresh and anew, it is this day and age in which we live. Recovery is, is a wonderful thing. The very word is full of hope. 1973, four years old, and I contracted what was known as then the London flu. The great-grandfather of the swine flu, which was big and prevalent back around 2012. Had that one too, got the t-shirt. Now you have it. And it is, I guess you call it an H1N1 uh, situation. Uh, 
it was not fun. I remember getting sick, and then the fever came. And, of course, my fever spiked. And it was bad enough that they had to hospitalize me. And I remember bits and pieces of being in the hospital. Delirium because of the fever being high. I don't know how high a child's fever can get, but mine was high. I remember drips, drips, drips. Oh, and more drips uh, as, as after that as well. Then they did the alcohol rubs to try to break the fever. Now, what the science is behind that, I don't know, but I remember it. I remember the pungent smell. Then the ice packs to try to break the fever. And then at times when the fever would break and these massive sweats and they're trying to change either my pajamas or, or by then just the, the hospital gowns so that I did not develop pneumonia. It was a critical time in my life that I was bliv uh, blissfully, <laughs> ignorantly unaware of, which is sometimes ignorance is bliss. And then I remember coming really to coherent. It had been many days. Lena was our maid, she was our family helper, she was, uh, yes, if you want to use the term, the help, uh, she was in that regard, only we treated her as a member of the family with the utmost courtesy and respect. As far as I'm, even though she's dead and gone over low these almost 25 years now, um, she is a member of my extended family, but much, much beloved. And so she was in that hospital room, and I remember looking at her, and I saw some of my books and comic books laid out. And I remember saying to her in a four-year-old voice, Ena, eed to me, which I will translate that as, Lena, read to me. And I remember just tears flowing, and of course you're little, you don't know why, I'm like, what did I do, <laughs> you know? And she said, oh, hon, I will read whatever you want. Apparently I had been a sick child. And I slowly began that road to recovery, uh, eating uh, not solid foods at first, semi-solids, jello. I had a craving for jello, lime jello, lemon jello, orange jello, and it's in the cube. I love them in the cubes. I don't know how they do that, but I love them in that cubed form. Uh, the more the merrier. Crackers, saltines, eventually graduating to the regular foods that I would like to eat as a four-year-old. And then the only one I didn't like was what I call the Tylenol Jello. You know, that's cherry Jello. It tastes like Tylenol. That's the only one I didn't really like. But in time, my strength came back, and I got to go home. And obviously, as I stand here before you, lo, these 40-plus years later, almost 50 now, full recovery. Jesus desired a full recovery for the church at Ephesus. They had been doctrinally correct and yet essentially a loveless congregation. They had taken that first love for Christ, that first love or that fervent love for one another and for whatever reason had placed it to the side, either forgetting about it or just simply neglecting it and walking away. And he faithfully commended their accomplishments. They did some amazing and awesome things. But he also firmly confronted their condition and their condition was indeed critical. And then, like the great physician that he is, he provided the prescription, calling them to remember, then to repent, then to return, and then to redo that which makes for a fervent first love. The Bible says, as we think about the comfort that he also is now providing, because, you know, when sometimes you've got to share difficult news with somebody or, or perhaps maybe negative news to somebody, you don't want to just leave them hanging uh, you want to, especially with students sometimes, you don't want to just leave them hanging, waiting for the sword to drop. You try to soften that a little bit. You try to say, well, you know, uh, you didn't do so good on this test, but hey, this next test is coming. It's going to have some of the same material. You've got this. Just a little bit extra effort, and you've got this. I believe in you. I believe that, in a sense, that Jesus, when he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, that is bringing comfort to bear to a church that needed it. We think about Citizens Band Radio, CB. Some of, It's still in use today, I'm sure, uh, even though cell phones are the rage nowadays, but they still use it. It's very useful on the road, especially for long-haul truckers. It was very famous in the late 70s. Just about everybody had one, whether they had a license part or not, but I remember people having it. Uh, Smoking the Bandit was a movie that really popularized it with Burt Reynolds. 
And then, of course, the song Convoy, and I mercifully will not sing that song for you this morning, in which the people probably would say amen. But in the spirit of the text, in thinking in the, in the, lingu, in the lingo of CB as of 1978, it may have changed since then, the church of 2020, like Ephesus, needs to have its ears on to what the Spirit is saying now. And then our response should be, come back, Roger, copy that, 10-4. other words, yes, Lord, speak for your servants, listen, so that we may experience that comfort and recovery and those times of refreshing from the Lord that he may use us in ways greater than we have been used before. Recovery is what Jesus desired for the church at Ephesus. In Christ, that recovery was, and it is possible even now, to apply that spiritual first aid to the first love so they could come back and not just be back at where they were, but be where they were and become even greater than they had been. I would submit to you this morning that recovery involves hearing. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There is a personal aspect to this. It's addressed to the church as a whole at Ephesus, which was a series of house churches coming together, but it is also a call to each individual. Hearing, according to the scholars, is a metaphor for perceiving and understanding with the heart and the mind. Each individual had the ability, therefore they had the responsibility to pay attention and to act upon Christ's communication to them. It would be their path to healing, their path to recovery, therefore their path to vitality and victory again. In the language of the New Testament, we get the English word acoustics from, it means to listen, it relates to hearing the voice of God spiritually at work within each of us, prompting him to uh, what is called to imbirth faith in us. In other words, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and then we act in faith. It's a call to action. Action that can be attempted. And it's action that can be accomplished. Brittany Chan said, God, let your voice become the loudest one I hear and the one I'm most sensitive to. Would to God that the church, our church and our sister churches in 2020 as we move into the remaining months of this year have such a sensitivity to what the Spirit is saying to His church as a whole and to each and every one of us individually. It also is not just personal. There is a peculiar or special aspect of that. Each person at Ephesus had their own unique life experience, just like you and I do today, specifically regarding that condition where it affects their first love and their fervent love. It's not a generic or just generalized issue, but each person had a place where they would plug into that. And the need was great and widespread. Applying the prescription of Jesus Christ would benefit then the whole body at Ephesus, and it does the same in 2020 as well. Dr. Henry Blackaby says, and I quote, It is time in all of our churches for God's people to experience the real presence of our living Lord, guiding us collectively and to adjust our lives to His purpose and activity. He personally communicates His will to His people, inviting each church to join in His activity in specific ways. When we hear His call and respond appropriately, there will be no limit to what God can and will do through His people. To that I would add, Amen. May that be our experience. May that be the experience of all of our sister churches in 2020. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. As we apply this, as we think about this uh, recovery involving hearing, in 2020, each of us have ears to hear. Each one of us has that personal ability to hear what the Lord would say through His Word by His Holy Spirit. And therefore, each of us, myself included, we have the responsibility to have our ears on, to Roger, copy that, and not just to hear it and move on, but to hear it and to heed what is being said. 
as our life story would plug in to his. We have the Bible. We have the Spirit of God as our teacher. We have those around us who are at different levels of their own spiritual journey and development who God can use to speak words of encouragement, words of, of admonition, words of edification so that we can be further down the road ourselves that we might also be move, drawing near to the Lord Jesus Christ, remembering that first love and, and fanning. I would like to think that we still have and, and will have that fervent first love. I'm not trying to sound negative this morning. So assuming that, then, oh God, through your Holy Spirit, help each of us to fan that first love into a hotter and brighter flame as we go into 2020. Are we listening and are we doing? Let us do ourselves and each of us a favor, heeding what we would hear. Whatever areas in our life need that healing and need that recovery, then let us say, oh Lord, speak, because my soul needs you, my heart needs you, my mind needs you, my life needs you, this world needs you, and use me, Lord, to touch a world. But then, as I'm prone to pray, Lord, change hearts, change minds, and start with mine. When it comes to that fervent first love, how might the Holy Spirit speak to you in ways that are personal to you, ways that might be peculiar? And I don't mean that word in some strange way or pejorative way. I mean that word in a, in a very special way. In other words, it, you are the only you there is. So be the best version of you that you can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what might the Spirit talk to you about in a way that is unique to you? He desires the best for you. He commands the best from you and myself as well. Let us hear and therefore heed what the Spirit would say to us and what the Holy Spirit would say about us so that we find that experience of being in His presence and will. As I read this morning in Psalm 89, learning to, to walk in His presence, to joy in His presence, and to praise Him, and knowing that joy, regardless of what goes around, knowing that joy that comes from loving and serving Him, who is our shield, who is our strength, who is our glory and strength. You know, recovery not only involves healing, it involves, obviously, hearing. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's the, uh, Revelation 2, verse 7, the second part of that. Naval sonar operators, I have a high respect for them. They have a job unlike any other. They run sensitive and sophisticated sound equipment meant to track, detect, re recognize, analyze objects and noise underwater and then to assess it to determine is it a natural phenomenon or is it a threat and then to recommend the action that needs to be taken. No, no, no pressure there. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. With my kind of hearing, sometimes I, if I, if when you have your mask on, if I don't always read your lips, I'm having to lean in. Sometimes on a Wednesday night during prayer meeting, I have to do this number. Yes, I probably listened to rock music way too loud when I was a teenager. Mama said it was going to ruin my hearing. Oh, what did she know? So I amped it up. Well, I wish I had kind of toned it down because at age 51, I don't always hear as plainly as I did. You would not want me as your anti-submarine warfare uh, officer on, at all. Uh, my hearing, I might hear something that's not there. But they have to hear, and they have to listen, and they have to act. That was true for the church at Ephesus, and it is true for you and me. It is action-oriented. The text envisions an overcomer, a victor, the very word burst with action. Understanding requires action. Remember that assent, that is, you know, uh, just agreeing. Assent does not ensure the Ascent. In other words, if you're going to climb the mountain, you agree there's a mountain that needs to be climbed, that's great. But until you begin climbing the mountain, just agreeing about it is not going to get you up the mountain. In the movie Karate Kid, some of you have seen that. I've seen both versions. I referenced the 1984 version in case you have a different uh, version in mind. Young Daniel is trained by Mr. Miyagi. You know, wax on, wax off. Okay, that's all you'll get. He's a martial arts instructor who teaches Daniel, who's been kind of bullied by a group called the uh, Cobra Kai Dojo. Uh, he's teaching him to defend himself, but he has a kind of a natural talent. But he's teaching him using these mundane, everyday 
activities that Daniel thinks has no reference until finally Miyagi shows him how wax on can be a way to block and certain other moves that he learned in cleaning and, and doing work. And as a result, he's able to compete in a championship against one of the bullies, a guy by the name of Johnny. And of course, Johnny has injured him, but he uses the crane. No, I will not try to act on stage the crane maneuver, okay? It might, it, might, uh, it might get us a lot of views online. I'm sure it would, people. Uh, we would be trending all week long. But if I fall and, and hurt myself, that ain't going to be cool, and nobody wants to have that image on cyberspace, I promise you. In other words, he does that, and he wins. It's a solid kick. It wins, it wins the match. And even Johnny presents him with the trophy because he has a newfound respect. All that to say is that hearing is action-oriented. That in the Karate Kid, he had to listen, yes, but he actually had to do what was being told so that he became better than he was. It's also accomplishment-oriented. Christ envisioned a holy, healthy church at Ephesus, acting on the prescription, achieving the desired result, all by His grace. It's only possible by His grace, nothing else a full return and recovery to that first love because Christ wanted to use the church at Ephesus to reach people, to bring others from a pagan environment into his fold. And the same is true for you and me this morning. Just as Paul called the Ephesians to put on the full armor of God so that the final result was that they would be able to remain standing, just like, just like in the Karate Kid after he had been injured, but he remained standing. Although one leg is bummed, he does the crane maneuver to win the day. You put on the armor of God so that when it's all said and done, you remain standing up. Success breeds success, and God is the one who sets us up and helps us to succeed for Him. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Application from that is that our faith, then that is put into action. Yet all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than overcomers, through Him, who's Him? Jesus, who loved us, Romans 8, 37. The reward promise is a comfort that is suited to the, the Ephesian church hearers. To eat from the tree of life symbolizes that eternal life with God. Yes, it is the living forever and forever, endless days. Yes, that is the icing on the cake. But it is also the essence of life, the essential life, the vitality of life right here, right now, amid times of trial and challenge. A person, a congregation who applies this first aid to their first love experiences the essential eternal life that is already theirs in Christ, here and now and in the beyond to come. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Proverbs 11.30 Christ is all about life. He is life incarnate and He desires for you to experience that life. Yes, that eternal life, that forgiving and cleansing from sin that you enter into a love relationship for Jesus died on the cross for your sin and He rose from the grave paying the price for your sin and my sin. And that is the message that we make no apology for, that we never ever step back, hush up from or back off of this world in 2020 desperately needs to hear that. And may the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit get a hold of each and every person who has has not a relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh God, use us. Use us. Our hands and our feet, may we be the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ. That there is a Savior who loves you unconditionally and who desires to have you walk with Him and who will walk with you and will never, ever leave you. That is the gospel that we preach, that there is no life too law. There is no situation that is too extreme or too whatever that Jesus Christ cannot redeem it and cannot repurpose it for His grace, for His glory, for His good. The paradise of God was a symbol of a place of beauty and peace, a place of rest. We obviously, rightly so, understand it as heaven. Paradiso in the language of the, of the New Testament means a garden, a park. The idea that they in the Persian period had these parks just like we have parks today where they had sections off where they had the um, where they had animals that just roam free that you could enjoy 
and where they had beautiful fruit gardens and flower gardens, a place of security and serenity, a beautiful place. I've been to Grant's farm on an occasion, a massive park, a variety of animals running free on the range, but still, obviously, so they can't get out. And you see them as you ride on this tourist train over all the sloping hills. There's petting zoos and there's recreational areas in abundance. Dr. Robert Mount says, symbol of the state in which God and the people are restored to that perfect fellowship which existed before the entrance of sin into the world. The application for Ephesus being that, that applying that prescription to come back to that fervent first love, that they would have that restoration they needed. It would be as if they were walking with Christ again for the first time, enjoying the presence, enjoying his pleasure, enjoying uh, that, that power that he gives for living. And I use that word prosperity very loosely because it sometimes come, comes across in a very negative way. I don't want you to think I'm suggesting that, but I'm saying that sense of God making Ephesus effective again, making Ephesus excellent again. And he desires that for the church of 2020, and he desires that for you and for me. Recovery, spiritually or otherwise, is possible, and it is worth the effort of following Christ's prescription. Vitality can begin again. It can begin right here, right now, today. It is worth making the fight for God's paradise exists. Yes, for his church. There is a rest for the people of God. There is a place that is perfectly secure, perfectly serene. And wherever Christ is, that is the very definition of heaven. But we can also have at least a preview and a taste of that here and now. That place of serenity and security and beauty and blessing that is also associated with his presence right now. It can be a preview, and if it is such a preview, what a wonderful preview it is. So that if and when, not if, when we have opportunity to encounter others outside the doors of this sanctuary, outside the, the confines of our uh, church uh, body, people who live in our community who are broken, people who are in our community who are hurting, people who are in our community who are confused, people who are in our community who are lost, who have not the hope that you and I have, may they look at our lives, may they look at Chunky Baptist Church, and may they see by the grace of God a preview of that serenity and that security that is found Found in a beautiful place, and that place is in the presence by the very side of Jesus Christ who rests in our heart. It should spur us this sense of paradise then, as it should have spurred Ephesus. It should, it should spur us then to a faithful love, to a fervent love, to a frequent love. Love is not something that you do hit and miss when you feel like it, hot or cold, every now and then. Oh, now this week I plan to be very loving. going to be awesome. But then next week, i got some things going on. Uh, if I love, great, fine. If I don't, fine. I'm not feeling too merciful today. That is not good. Okay, that is not a healthy spiritual recipe. That is not the prescription that the Lord calls us. But rather to say, oh God, use me as a channel of your love and blessing each day. One of the prayers I try to pray as I begin my day, Lord, I give you my head, my heart, and my hands. Use me as your man, your minister, and your messenger for this day. Don't know what this day may hold, but you hold the day. Use me. Speak so that I may hear, and then, Lord, help me to put it into practice. A frequent love. That is what this world needs. Yes, it needs the truth. Yes, it needs a sobering warning. There are so many, so many sermons I could preach in that regard this morning, but I won't do it because time does not permit but what the people need, they need to see that love of Jesus Christ. They, they need to see that love that's l real and lived out. They need to see it as part of a relationship that you and I have first with the Lord, that you and I share with one another so that as we then venture out into our community, they see a love that is faithful, fervent, and frequent, a faithful love for Christ, a fervent love for the congregation, and then therefore that frequent love then that is constantly reaching out with the open hand to the community at large. May God use such a love among us to provide a preview for others around us. Like the church at Ephesus, the church of 2020 must hear. It must heed what the Spirit says each day. It must make the effort by God's offered and available grace in remembering 
that goes for me first before it goes to anybody else, in repenting, in returning and redoing what is connected to that frequent, fervent first love for Jesus Christ, for one another, for others. And when I pray, oh Lord, change hearts, change minds, change directions, change destinies, I'm always reminded of what one evangelist said, I want to say it was Gypsy Smith, who said when you're praying for a revival, whether it's in, your, in a church or in a uh, crusade or whatever the case may be, he says take a piece of chalk, draw a little circle, put yourself in that circle and say, oh God, bring revival and let it start with the person in that circle. So I always pray, oh God, change heads, change hearts, change minds, change actions and let it begin with me. First first aid for that first love is available. And we are and can apply it. How desperate is the need in our world for churches that hear and follow what the Spirit is saying to them. The world in our day wants to see God at work through His people. But unless we hear and obey the things that He assigns us, things that only God can accomplish, the world will not experience Him. They will only see religion and be turned away. Dr. Henry Blackaby. So we come to the most important moment of this service. Yes, the Word of God is critically important because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word. But this is the opportunity to respond. And the altar is open for you to respond to whatever the Lord would place upon your heart. It may be that for the very first time that, that somebody is hearing the Word of God and they need to be saved and, and to make that public so that we could celebrate with you a new life. I would encourage you to come. There may be some other decision that is, needs to be made public. Whatever that decision may be, a w closer walk with Jesus, I don't know. But if the Lord calls you, I encourage you to come and we will celebrate with you. The altar is open as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. As our worship leaders come, I urge and ask and implore you to come as the Lord Jesus would lead you to come this morning.